Okay, welcome everyone to A Witch's Garden. I think first off, you can see that I love playing a witch. It's one of my favorite things to do, to dress up as a witch. I have a lot of costumes because let's face it, I love Halloween. It's my favorite holiday. The month of October is exciting to me and that it culminates in Halloween. It, it's just an added bonus for me. Now, I don't know if we have a lot of people that love Halloween out there, but if you do, perhaps your costume of choice is being a witch. And so that's one thing I, when I think of witches, I think of it as a costume choice, my first choice to go to. If you're not heavy into dressing up, you don't like to do that, but perhaps you like to decorate for Halloween and for the fall. Now, I just got the three little witches that sit in your front yard and hold hands, and it has creeped out every kid in the neighborhood. So they've done exactly what I wanted them to do. They really like them a lot. Uh, but perhaps you like that witch who has a poor sense of direction. Um, I know that's very popular. Uh, GPS isn't working for her. Or maybe you're a traditionalist and you like to go toward the witch in the cauldron surrounded by her familiars. Still others, I think you maybe enjoy a spooky tale. I think that's one of my favorite things too. I can tell you, my husband is so dismayed with the start of October because it's when I start watching Hocus Pocus over and over and over again. So he kind of hides in the attic while I'm watching the Sanderson sisters. He can take it once, but not the volume of times I watch it. Perhaps so you prefer Shakespeare. So uh, the Macbeth witches are great and have survived time after time, uh, just wonderful, wonderful witches. Well, witches show up not just in October. They're not just a Halloween thing. Anybody here have a kitchen witch? I know I have one. It supposedly brings you good luck. Well, I've never burned down my kitchen, so I guess she's doing her job. I did start a fire in a toaster oven once, but that's a story for another time, so I'm not going to go into that. There's another witch, too, that shows up not in October, but in January. And she also is one of my favorites. Her name is Labafana. She is a Christmas witch. And she very much is part of Italian culture. And she brings coal to children that have been naughty. And she brings toys and candy to those that have been good. Now, I was very fortunate to be in Italy a couple years ago in January for Epiphany when Labafana showed up. And I happened to be in Venice. So she doesn't show up on a broom. She takes a gondola. And that morning in Venice was the strangest I had ever spent because every gondola was filled with at least one or two witches. Uh, that's how they got around in the canals. So witches, you know, have appeared in many, many places. They're not just a Halloween entity. Uh, what I like most about the history of witches is their connection to magic and medicine. And if you look back in time, uh, long, long ago, women were the healers. They were the women in the villages and the towns that you would go to if you had a headache, if you had a stomach ache. Uh, you, they would help you uh, with childbirth if you needed them to help deliver a baby. But they were also the ones you would go to for a love potion or they would be the ones that would help you with a protection spell. And they probably weren't called witches, or they may have been called other things such as wise women, green women, old wives, midwives, nurses, healers. So a lot of different names for them. But again, mixing medicine and magic. Now we know that witches through history have not been treated kindly. And certainly the persecution of women accused of witchcraft was a, a dominant happening for a number of years, over 400 years, persecution of witches. And this occurred primarily between the years of 1400 and 1600. That's when the, the most activity occurred. And again, horrible, horrible endings for these women accused of witchcraft. Fortunately, this period... Uh, diminished, but there were many reasons why it came into being in the first place. And the two major ones are the rise of secular medicine, 
And again, physicians and that new forming uh, medicine societies really needed to discount these women that use more natural methods uh, as healing methods. And also the rejection of paganism. Paganism was an earth religion. It was very much in existence in agricultural communities. It dealt with plants and the changing seasons. And as that diminished, there began to be much more association of witches with evil. So as I said, fortunately that period diminished. And what remains though is still the understanding that these wise women had an incredible knowledge of plants. And they utilize not just plants they might grow, but also things that would occur naturally in the environment. So perhaps things that would grow in an open field or things that would grow in a forest along a stream or a lake. And that in addition to those things, they would grow themselves. Some were non-toxic, some were very toxic. So dosage was key to any type of plant that they would utilize. One thing I found very interesting is this still is part of modern medicine, the idea of using plants in medications. I had an interesting fact. I just want to read it to you. It's very short, I promise. As of 1961, 47% of new prescriptions written by physicians in America contained as one or more active ingredients a drug of natural origins. So again, these women knew how to utilize plants to provide uh, relief for various illnesses, to treat people, but also combined with magic because witches are magic. So what I'd like to do is just share a few plants, all things I know I grow in my yard and probably a number of them that you grow. And I bet by the end of the program, you will realize you too are growing a witch's garden at your home. Let me start not with a, a super common plant. I, not a lot of people grow it, I think, but it's my favorite. So I always want to start with this one. It's called the Tora. Also, moonflower, jimson weed. There's a lot of different varieties of this flower. I think the thing I love the most about it is that it opens in the evening. The large white blossoms almost glow. They're gorgeous and many of them have a beautiful scent. So they're really a, a magical kind of flower to have in your garden. I know in the South, jimson weed grows along the side of the road in the ditches. So I, they may see it more as a nuisance. I think, I think it's gorgeous. I love it. We grow it every year. Now it is a member of the nightshade family. So it is very toxic. And I know there's been instances of people that will eat the seeds and eat the plant and it can even lead to a hallucinogenic state. So I think probably I should say, don't eat any of this stuff. Please don't go chewing on these plants. It's really not safe. Jan will tell you Cooperative Extension does not condone this in any way. So please don't do that. But if uh, this was being utilized, again, dosage was key. And wise women would use this as a relaxant or a, a sedative. Also, it was thought to assist with asthma, to provide some asthma relief and to assist with breathing issues. Now, atropine is derived from this and it has an anesthetic effect. It's used in eye drops to dilate the pupils. So actually, you know, a, a chemical or a plant that's used today. Now there is a magic connotation to moonflower, of course. And it's said that if you breathe in the moonflower, it will stupefy you. Well, if anybody has smelled a moonflower at night, I think it's incredibly intoxicating. And I think that could mean that I've been stupefied many times by smelling the moonflowers in my garden. Let's look at another toxic plant, but one that has medicinal qualities and that's foxglove. This is a little cream colored foxglove. It's like a little mini foxglove I grow in my front yard and it's incredibly prolific. It reseeds itself. It's absolutely gorgeous, but my heart really wants one of these, these wonderful, tall, beautifully colored foxglove. It's joining my garden next year. I pulled something else out to make room for it. So next year I'll have one of these. Also called witch's bells and also known as digitalis. It was used by wise women to help uh, with excessive fluid retention, but also used for heart conditions. 
And as I was uh, researching, I found that it was a female herbalist who first introduced the use of digitalis to a physician. So again, it started with herbalists or wise women or witches. And again, dose critical. We certainly know digitalis is, is still used. So again, a heart ailment that started by use with herbalists. This is Monarda or bee bomb. So pretty. This is not in my yard because mine looked pretty powdery this year. So this is this is uh, somebody else's beautiful bee bomb, and also lemon balm. The bombs were considered by wise women to be cure alls. They were used for almost everything because they were said to have antiseptic qualities. So they would use these, maybe brew them into a tea or use it as a mouthwash. And again, it was supposed to aid it with an antiseptic quality. But lemon balm also could be utilized as a sleep aid. So it would have been utilized that way too. But if it's got balm in the title, usually it was considered a cure-all. Kind of the go-to herb in your yard. Catnip. Now you have to hunt for the catnip in this picture. I'm sorry, I know. A lot of petunias and other things going on, but to the right and trailing up, is the catnip. Um, if you've never grown catnip, be careful. It will take over just like lemon balm, just like mint. It, it loves your yard and it will grow up through cement. It doesn't matter, it, it will grow everywhere. And of course we know this primarily as something to make our cats very happy. And I know most of mine do uh, enjoy this. They love to eat it right out of the garden. I bring it in for them and they tend to get slightly frenzied and then they pass out for hours. And that's how wise women would have used this. They would have used it for its tranquilizing effect or as a relaxant, but also they used it as a digestive age, aid and also to combat cold and cough symptoms. So it would have been utilized in that way. But I think while we most think of it as this kind of sedation effect that it has, uh, not just on cats, but on people. One of my favorites, lavender. You have to hunt for it in these pictures because I have a very overcrowded yard. So if you look down to the right, uh, there's some of my lavender growing. Again, I only know one person who doesn't like the smell of lavender. I've only met one. I, I find it just so calming. And that's basically what wise women would use it for. A very calming effect uh, to use it as a sleep aid but it also is an anti-inflammatory. So it could have been used in that fashion. It's certainly edible. Um, I don't know if anybody has made bread or cookies with lavender. Again, dosage is key. There's a fine line between an edible cookie and a soap cookie. So <laughs> be very careful if you cook with lavender, but again, it was something that could be used medicinally. Now also it has magic connotations, but of course, right? This is a witch's program. If you bathe in lavender, it has a purification ability. So it's kind of a purification right to bathe in lavender, but also it increases awareness. And it certainly would be put in your uh, cauldron to brew love potions. You've got to have lavender if you're gonna have a good love charm or potion. And this is just another picture of the lavender interspersed with everything else. Um, but I love it. If you want to grow it, it it's, it's lovely. And uh, I'm personally not one to bake with it. Uh, even small amounts of lavender, I'd rather smell than eat. Peonies. I love, who doesn't love a peony, right? What a gorgeous scent and those big, beautiful blossoms. And this had magic connotations for are the wise women. They would use it as protection against negativity and negative energy. And I can't imagine smelling a peony and not feeling happy. I just think they are a mood enhancer. They certainly alter how you feel um, just to see them and to, and to take in that scent. So I think the wise women were onto something that it would protect against negative energy. Roses, we, we couldn't uh, complete a magic discussion without talking about roses. Roses certainly figured into love charms. Petals were considered something that would promote peace. The buds and petals certainly would be used with love charms. But also 
rose hips, high in vitamin C. Uh, you can buy rose hip tea, and that was supposed to also assist with digestive ailments to use that type of tea that would be brewed. I do want to mention, if you're going to go home and start doing love charms, let's focus on red roses. I think they're going to work much better for you. If you just want some friendship, maybe use a yellow, but you want red roses if you are going to do love charms. And remember to throw that lavender in there because that's another important component of our love charms. Now, fever few, I have to thank the Master Gardeners Gala because this plant was purchased at one of the galas and it is just doing incredibly well, fever few. I've even transplanted it in various spots and it continues to just be very prolific. So it's a gorgeous plant. If anybody has gone down a drugstore aisle or a supermarket aisle where they talk about herbal supplements, you're gonna find fever few. It's still in stores today and supposedly assists with migraine relief and to treat headaches. And that certainly, again, how wise women would have used it to deal with headaches. But also they used it uh, to combat fever, to deal with nausea and to treat asthma. So they had a little wider bank of how they felt fever few would help people. And a sunflower. We know we can eat the seeds. We know that oil comes from this. So we, we know it's edible, it's non-toxic. Uh, but for wise women, this was magical. And if you had sunflowers, that was supposed to bring you strength and courage. And I don't know if anybody has been able to see a field of sunflowers when they all turn their heads toward the sun. Uh, I can't think of anything else that doesn't make you feel better. So certainly that idea of strength and courage from these beautiful, beautiful sun-like blossoms. Uh, they, I think they work magic. They certainly do for me. I had, can tell you this one I did not plant. I don't plant any of my sunflowers myself. All the birds and the squirrels plant every sunflower that I have blooming in my yard throughout the year. So I want to thank them during this program too, because they do a great job. They're great gardeners in my yard. I, I thank them profusely. Now, I have to apologize for my next slide because this is a one plant. I'm very embarrassed to show it to you. This is my time patch. <laughs> I, I'm so embarrassed I should just blank this slide out. I, I promise a, a new one someday. Uh, this poor time is growing in my house stripper median. It's, it's not happy. It should be. It's full sun. It's awful soil. It should do just fine. Uh, but time, again, is an anti-inflammatory. It's antiseptic. Uh, it was used to help reduce coughing. And I found it very interesting as I looked into these various herbs and the history of the use by wise women and witches, that there are a lot of herbs that have antiseptic qualities. Things like basil and sage and peppermint joined that list, but also different plants such as yarrow and ladies mantle were considered to be antiseptic in nature. So I would think for wounds, for scratches, those type of things, they would have laid those things on or ingested them in some way. So there's a lot of plants out there that are they're fairly common and grown by a lot of people and enjoyed that have this medicinal quality, but also can help contribute to the magic that was practiced by the witches. So I just wanted to share some plants. I have a long, long list that I could add to this, but we are limited in our time. So I tried to focus on the ones that I grow in particular, but also that you may grow. And I just want to say in closing that I, I can never close this program without giving a bow to my favorite witch of herbology. She is the plant guru and the person that I would constantly seek out for assistance. So let's say a hearty thank you to Professor Sprout, who I believe is still at Hogwarts practicing today. So thank you. I thank you for your time and I'd welcome any questions. Hopefully I could answer them. So Jan, do you want me to, uh, I'm closed out of that. Okay, you okay. stop sharing. All right, I'm gonna start my video. Um, so we had one comment in the chat. Um, Christine doesn't like the smell of lavender. It gives oh, her migraines. <laughs> oh, that's sad. Because I get migraines, but the lavender doesn't do that. Maybe it's the volume of lavender. 
I don't know. I mean, plants affect people differently. That's true. Um, does anybody have a question that they would like to ask Connie? You can unmute yourself. Or if you'd like to see my hat. Is <laughs> I know, oh, I'm, my view is different. Oh, and I should probably give the disclaimer again. Yes. <laughs> Don't eat these plants. <laughs> yes, we don't recommend that. So this was for entertainment value, I believe. And who knows how many people these wise women might have harmed as they were checking dosage. We don't know that. That wasn't in the research. So. And I think that your history is interesting because we do have a lot of our medicines from plants. Right. Very much so. Yeah. And yet these women were really discounted, um, again, because of medical practices and the rise of physicians and those associations. They really discounted these women who had discovered so many things that were useful. 